Sparking Change explores the social impacts of park engagement in uh, underserved neighborhoods, um, but it also looks at the strategies that uh, community members, volunteers, uh, nonprofits, um, and city governments are using uh, to, uh, to um, uh, support their work in these impacts in parks. Uh, and this is really important work for park people. Uh, we've been heavily involved in this type of work for a number of years. Uh, we have granting programs like the TD Park Builders Program and the Weston Family Parks Challenge. If you want to hear more about those, there's a, a panel coming up, I think, later in this room. Uh, we also have a really amazing community outreach team uh, that works on knowledge sharing, support, and resource resources in communities across Toronto. Um, but this research is also, we think, important for uh, cities. Uh, so you know, cities like Toronto and many of the ones that we come from in this room are growing in inequality. Uh, we think it's really important to um, understand how parks and public spaces can help create more inclusive and equitable cities. So we wanted to sort of better understand the impact of the work that we were doing in Toronto, but um, also how to support that work more broadly. So with Sparking Change, we spoke with uh, community members, uh, city staff, and nonprofit staff in uh, seven different North American cities. Uh, and really the main takeaway from uh, the research was that um, their parks offer a really rich set of social benefits to neighborhoods, but that these benefits don't just happen by virtue of you know, having a park nearby. So it's not good enough just to have a park you know, sort of within that five or 10 minute walk. Uh, it really takes community-led involvement in um, activation, in programming, and events that bring that space to life, um, but also equally important, the support um, and investment from nonprofits and also governments um, in that community leadership and in that programming and in those improvements and maintenance to keep those spaces beautiful. So I'm going to go through the uh, five main impacts of the reports. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the strategies, but you have, I think, sort of a mini version of Sparking Change in your, in your conference package. And you can also go to our website and download the full report and read all about those strategies online. So park engagement helps create uh, a sense of change and shared ownership. Uh, and this was really shown through a woman that we spoke with named Lucy, uh, who works in Soundview Park in the Bronx in New York. And there she really tried to mobilize people in her neighborhood to come out and take part in the park, but people weren't really, they didn't really want to get involved right away. They said, you know, the park was kind of, they felt it was a little unsafe. Um, they, uh, they said the park was kind of dirty, um, wasn't really much going on there. So she started working with um, some community members in her neighborhood and also an organization called Partnerships for Parks um, in New York to do some simple programming around arts, um, some improvements around gardens. And, what she found was that the more she did in this sort of visible way in the neighborhood by being out in the park and doing this, um, the more people in the neighborhood wanted to get involved. So it's often about doing these very small, simple, but visible things um, in the park that fos helps foster that sense of neighborhood pride and also uh, momentum for others to get involved. Park engagement helps build confidence and inspire civic leaders. Um, so often people's first um, kind of experience with community organizing or advocacy uh, is in their local park. Uh, and we found that this can lead to other civic involvement. So people join local community development boards after their involvement in their park. They worked on political campaigns. Uh, they advocated on other issues sort of unrelated or tangentially related maybe to parks. And they connected with other groups across their city. Uh, so a really good example of this in Toronto is the Friends of Regent Park, who um, is a park group in, in that city. In Toronto, um, and they went to City Hall to actually make a deputation on the city's poverty reduction strategy. Park engagement also can um, help reduce social isolation and create inclusive communities. And this is a really big theme that we heard across pretty much everyone that we talked to. Um, you know, people wanted parks to be inviting. They wanted their park to be a place where people could gather. Um, they wanted it, people to come out of their homes or out of their apartment neighborhoods, uh, out of their apartments into the park. Um, but this type of uh, park, it doesn't just happen. Um, you really need um, that relevant and fun programming to actually encourage people to come out. And one of the women we spoke with, Nawal, in Flemington Park, um, said that uh, the goal of her volunteer group was really to, to reduce social isolation. Um, you know, people said in that neighborhood wanted um, a place to come out, um, to hang out, uh, to gather, um, and just sort of have, have tea in the park. Uh, and so the best way we heard about doing this from a number of different people is around food. Um, so Nawal's group actually worked to create a pop-up cafe that opens up and serves food to people uh, made by people in the neighborhood during some of the events that they put on in the park. Park engagement provides a place for diverse people to gather. 
Um, so we heard that parks can be these really powerful places of social connection that help uh, break down barriers and also reduce intolerance between people. Um, but that only happens if we create the opportunities for everyone to become involved in creating those places in a meaningful way. So this includes um, including people of different cultural and ethnic backgrounds, uh, but also youth, so teenagers, newcomers, and older adults, and others in the community. And it's really also important, we heard, um, to recognize history and culture that has been systemically erased from uh, the landscape. So uh, one of the people that we talked to was um, in Portland, uh, a guy working in Cully Park there. And he said a central uh, feature of that park is actually an intertribal gathering garden that is co-managed by local indigenous people and the city parks department. Finally, we heard that park engagement can help support local economic development. Um, and this was actually a little bit of a surprising but an exciting finding for us. Um, so sometimes this was jobs in the park. So there's construction-related jobs. Um, in that previous example with Cully Park, uh, people were employed uh, from the neighborhood to actually take part in the soil assessment for that new park as it's built on a landfill. Um, but parks can also be really important startup sites for local economic development. Um, and I'm not going to get too much into this because I know Sabina is going to be talking about the Thorncliffe Park uh, market, but I think there's a really exciting opportunity to think of parks as these spaces for local entrepreneurs. So bringing it all together um, kind of uh, into these three key insights that we got. Um, the first is that idea that programming is key, that it's not just about the physical amenities, although those are important, um, but people need that sort of reason to be invited to come to the park and to meet their, uh, meet their neighbors. Um, so whether it's food um, or arts or physical activity or performance-based programming, the important thing is that you're really tapping into the energy um, and, um, and the desires and talents in that local community and that that programming is led by members of the community. The second is this idea that park engagement can be a gateway or a launching pad for people. Um, so this is you know, through wider civic involvement, um, through further volunteering, as I said, through those local economic development opportunities, but also opportunities to build skills and professional networks through a park setting. And the last thing is this idea that small is big. Um, you know, we heard from everyone that um, big picture thinking and vision making is really important in getting people involved. But it's really the small wins, the simple projects, and celebrating those milestones along the way that um, get people excited and encourage other people to get involved in the park. So this could be as simple as organizing a park cleanup. Um, it could be sprucing up a garden. Um, but it could also be having a community dinner where you're inviting people to come to the park and share their ideas about what they want that park to be. So we're really excited to, um, to take the ideas in this report and put them into practice in the work that we do. Um, and I know that many people in this room are doing this type of work already and working in these areas. And I know we're at, at Park People, you know, our work has been in Toronto um, to date, but we're really excited about uh, working with all of you in the room and others in this area uh, to bring more of this across Canada. So thank you. I should say um, that each panelist has eight minutes, and uh, Jake, you did a really great job moving through the material, so thank you for that. We're going to move through the panelists one at a time, so just come up after the last presenter is done, um, and then we'll do our Q&A at the end. So, Sabina. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I think it's an honor for a grassroots organization like Thorncliffe Park Women's Committee to be presenting at this conference. Thank you so much. Um, Um, to start with uh, who we are, uh, we are a resident-led group that we came, that came together in 2008 with a vision of uh, transforming our local park, the public space, and uh, uh, transforming it uh, into a place that enriches and builds the community and the neighborhood. So we are talking about RV Burgess Park now. And a little snapshot about Thorncliffe Park neighborhood, uh, which is located in central East Toronto, densely populated, uh, high concentration of uh, South Asian immigrants, but a little uh, percentage of Filipinos, Chinese, Hungarians, Latin Americans, and recent uh, Syrian refugees as well. And um, the, uh, the, the beauty of this neighborhood is it's, it's surrounded by Don Valley system on the three sides, and then um, high-rise buildings, then lo low-rise buildings, the park, the, uh, the town center, which is all connected. 
Um, our story began in 2008, uh, and I was a newcomer at that time. I visited the park, and I really didn't like the space, and I questioned myself, can I really be in North America? Because this is not what I was expecting in the park. So it was really dirty. There were no garbage bins, um, garbage here and there, uh, uh, patches of grass, and kids lining up for the swing, very few kids. And there was no engagement in the park. So uh, how, um, as the mothers, we, the women from the neighborhood, we got uh, together and we had the same vision of transforming the park. So we have to fix it. So how do we do that? So we contacted the city um, officials and got um, uh, them to the park and we inv invited the councillor um, during that time and we gave them the tour and by engaging the women, children, and youth. We had a long wish list that we uh, submitted uh, to the city parks staff. And still, um, like after nine years too, we still have things coming in the park, which is so great. Uh, the first thing that we got in the park was the garbage bins. So we really wanted to celebrate getting garbage bins in the park. We got the kids involved and uh, did the cleanup in the park. Um, as Stonecliff is a landing mat for the immigrants, it is important um, for the women and children to come out of their crowded apartments because each family had like five to six children and they are living in the apartment buildings and they had, had no access to the green space. So it was very important for us um, to make residents feel park as their backyard. So we really wanted people to come out, and especially the women, because uh, they are coming uh, to the new country and they are going through stress and isolation on a regular basis. So we thought it is very important for these women and children to break the uh, barriers of culture, ages, language, and to the natural world. We wanted the park to be a uh, a community uh, space, a community hub where everybody from different backgrounds come together, meet their neighbors, share information, have fun, celebrate, enjoy that park space. So um, as uh, things were coming very slowly from the city and we thought like um, our community center, Jenna John Murray was under renovation. So there were no opportunities for the children in the park, the recreation opportunities. And Thorncliffe has 34% of population of the children between 0 to 14 years of age. So it was very important to have that kind of uh, programming. <laughs> So we started with the Arts in the Park programming, where we got the kids involved, the parents came in, and we had the conversation with the parents at one side, and we got the children involved in the arts program. And this was all the, on the volunteer basis, and all the residents, especially the women, running these programmings. And we also invited the local artists to perform in the park, like science show, um, storytelling. And after each performance, again, there is um, a cleanup activity in the park. We did that so that this, this, to raise a sense of belonging to the kids, that they take the ownership of the park, that this park belongs to them, and they have to keep the park clean. So that was very successful. We had the 10-week-long uh, Arts in the Park program, uh, which was a huge success. And then winter came in, and we thought, what do we do in winter? So we planned with the city. We got Toronto City, uh, Toronto Library involved, uh, Toronto Police involved, 53 Division, um, Parks involved, Recreation staff involved, and we organized the Winter Carnival. Because this is very important, especially for the newcomers. You have to celebrate winter. There's no other option. <laughs> so, so we had a successful winter carnival. And uh, this uh, February, we celebrated our ninth winter carnival. So I think we have come a long way. And uh, in the same year, in summer, we came with the concept of having a market in the park, what that market looks like. So. There is a farmer's market, and there's a good food market. They have the policies for that. And our market was very different, very unique. It was somewhere in between that. 
because we had women uh, who wanted to sell clothing, jewelry, because they were working as a quiet operators in their apartment buildings. They bring things from their home countries and they sell it out to their neighbors, friends at a very good cost. Uh, so that uh, we thought like we should give them the platform in the park using that public space so that they can expand their clientele and moreover um, build their self-esteem, improve their conversation skills and uh, meet with each other, socialize. So that was very important for us. And women taking a lead, that particular day was only for the women. And men supporting the women, taking care of the children in the park. And our park is, uh, was open to everybody. The women do, uh, selling stuff, the children in the arts activities, some playing in the a splash pad, so it's a safe environment that we created in the park. So um, that year, the city was on the strike. We didn't go through the permits at all. We just did it, and it was a huge success. The first market, we only had five women vendors, and people started looking from the apartment buildings, and that night, it, the park completely transformed. We just got like hundreds of people coming to the park. And as a newcomer myself, I didn't realize this. This is a kind of um, engagement that we need. People getting involved, giving their opinion. And during the markets, we also uh, laid down the huge sheet of paper where people put in all their ideas, what they would like to see in the park. That was again submitted to the city. So. This is the Arts of the Park programming that we do every Wednesday and Fridays during the market and also on Wednesdays. We also uh, have um, give out the board games for the children to play. And we also we run the community garden, one in the park, one is in the backyard of one of the private property landlords. And uh, uh, community garden is an asset to the, both the schools that we have in the neighborhood. We get about 60 classes visiting the community garden. They do everything from planting, watering, harvesting with our volunteers and with the teachers. And they harvest the produce, take the produce to the kitchen, and make soup with the teachers. You know, I uh, am a little fast so that I don't want to miss anything. Uh, and uh, uh, this garden is supported by uh, TD Friends of Environment Foundation. Thank you so much, Caroline. And um, this was the markets that we have run every Friday from May until October. And during Ramadan, because this is a thickly Muslim population, we run the markets until midnight. Sorry. We use the park and we animate the park in the night with the lights. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, just to, um, you know, like have people engage, to include all people from different cultures in the market. And uh, this, is, this is the pilot that we run, Ravine program with the youth. Uh, this, uh, this was uh, supported by Western Family Foundation with Toronto Parks Challenge. And it has been a huge success. And now this program is being continued with the support of TD Friends of Environment Foundation. Um, the next is the Tandoor Bake Oven, which is a unique oven. Different uh, City of Toronto parks have different ovens in the park, pizza bake ovens, and we thought Tandoor would represent the South Asian culture and heritage in this neighborhood. So we got this Tandoor Oven and the support of Dave Harvey, Park People, Toronto Food Strategy, Park Ramit Mahan. They all supported in getting, and the city, getting the tandoor oven in the park. So we make the bread every Friday. So if you do visit uh, Toronto on Friday, my, uh, Fridays, please visit our park on Fridays and uh, taste our freshly made oven. So we also had the movie nights in the park, partnering with TIFF. And uh, this is about the winter carnival. And last year, we ran a pop-up park cafe for all 14 weeks in the park that was run by the youth itself. So these were the high school youth. We gave them the startup money, and they used that money for the all, all 14 weeks. So they didn't come back and ask the money for, uh, from us. Um, la last summer, we, got, we gave the tour to City Parks Alliance. Um, 
and that we got connected with them through, again, Dave Harvey. They awarded us our uh, RV Burgess and our um, programming as a frontline part, which was such a great achievement. It was the first uh, Canadian part that was given that honor. And park beautification, again, involving children so that they take the ownership of the things that they have planted. They will take care of that. So we implanted 150 bulbs uh, in the raised bed in the park. So we are looking forward to a great spring. And markets serve as an incubation. We also connect our local entrepreneurs to the different markets uh, around GTA, which is like um, Tasty Thursdays, Evergreen Brickworks, and we also replicated our market in uh, Flemington neighborhood as well. So these are the developments. It's a long list. We got the used playground equipments, new swings, power outlets, new pathway, a new shed, uh, tandoor bake oven, and recently the 30 trees that were planted in the park. This is how we engage everybody all from all ages. And she's our auntie who visits her park quite often, and we got a bike blender that day, and she tried to make smoothie out of that, <laughs> using the bike blender. Uh, partnerships are really important, and thank you so much. The City of Toronto, Parks, Forestry, and Recreation Department, Park People, Silos, um, Food Share, Evergreen Brickworks, um, Summer Hill, there are quite a lot. The list is endless, and we also have other grassroots too. And uh, thank you so much for your time. That was great. You did awesome. Awesome. Work. Thank you, Sabina. Um, are we working? We're good? So, um, Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you this morning about the Moore Moss Park uh, project. Uh, we're actually uh, doing a feasibility study in the city of Toronto. Um, and uh, what we're looking at is the redevelopment of John Innes Community Centre, Moss Park Arena, and the surrounding parklands. And for us, the part of the feasibility study is doing site design work, community consultation work, uh, financial analysis in relation to the overall costs and long-term capital implications, uh, and then looking at governance. I won't go, I have a whole whack of slides and unfortunately I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, run through some of them because I wanna try to stick to the eight minute um, uh, time limit. But the two principles that I think are important to talk about when we're thinking about social inclusion are clearly about inclusivity and how you build inclusive community spaces, community parks, and how you create accessible spaces for everyone. So who's involved in this project? That was a bad hair day for me. Uh, we are working with the City of Toronto, the 519. Um, so the 519 is an agency of the City of Toronto. We actually are, run a community centre in downtown Toronto. Uh, we have a particular focus on the LGBT community uh, and run a range of programs and services for marginalised queer and trans folks in the City of Toronto, um, as well as for the local community. Uh, and we were working in partnership with a private philanthropic partner for about four years now to look at the redevelopment or a build of a new community center with a particular focus on sport and recreation. So we were able to work collaboratively with uh, the City of Toronto and our private philanthropic partner and our local community to actually undertake the feasibility study. High level demographic analysis related to uh, Moss Park. So similarly to what Sabina described, Moss Park is a low income neighborhood in downtown Toronto. Uh, certainly Adrian spoke about it uh, today earlier. Gentrification is a significant uh, occurrence in downtown Toronto, especially in Toronto downtown east. There are th 3,000 new condo units that are going in. So the impact on that neighborhood, we knew we had to embed and understand the impacts of gentrification and particularly on those in marginalized communities. Um, so uh, just to give you a high level sense of the current site, this current site is operated by Parks, Forestry and Rec. Janie was here uh, talking earlier in terms of presenting, Adrian. Uh, it's a 3.4 hectare uh, downtown park. It's currently run again by PFNR. 
uh, and an arena board actually operates the, the Moss Park Arena. So it's an interesting space. There's about 10,000 hours of service annually. They have 80,000 visits uh, in their neighborhood. It's an interesting park. It's kind of a mixed space. They've got this big, massive uh, ball diamond uh, that you're kind of intersecting with a sports, um, sorry, a, a soccer pitch, as well as basketball. So you can play all three sports at one time, which makes it really interesting uh, for the local neighborhood and community. To give you some sense, though, on the other side of Sherburn, which is just on the side of, uh, in front of the um, John Innes Community Center, is Maxwell Meehan, which is a fairly large uh, homeless shelter in the city of Toronto. So there's some real challenges in relation to how uh, the discharge practices um, are impacting the community or in, in, in the park. So when we decided to uh, be engaged in this process, it was important for us when we thought about the community consultation process to be very intentional and take a community organizing strategy. Uh, again, this was about ensuring that the people who don't typically participate in community consultations were included in the consultation process. That was central to us as a principle in relation to building inclusive, accessible spaces. Uh, we were, wanted to make sure that we really went out uh, and talked to people where they were at. So we hired three amazing community organizers, Karen's here, love them, uh, Jamie and Shava. Uh, and their particular focus was working with indigenous communities. Um, Moss Park area is uh, home to many Aboriginal and indigenous serving organizations, so it was centrally important that we worked with them. Uh, they spent a lot of time embedded in the community, talking with youth, working with um, sex workers, uh, people who are engaged in substance use, um, using substances, who are homeless, living in the park at night, uh, families and children and seniors. And so again, really embedding themselves in the neighborhood and the community to make sure that the voices of people again, who don't typically participate in those big public town hall meetings uh, were included in the process. So we did everything from community events, information tables, one-on-one -on -one interviews, focus groups, online surveys. Uh, and we're just going to tell you a little bit about the Moss Park Project, which was one of the initiatives that we did. It's kind of an adorable picture, I have to say. So everyone knows parks are animated, and people live in parks in different times of the day, and different activities happen. So we started at 7 o'clock in the morning, went to midnight. We hired local artists in the neighborhood to actually spend time doing a portrait of all the people that we came across uh, in that day. It was a great opportunity from a social procurement or um, opportunities to create employment, but more than anything, it allowed people to sit down, for in some cases, the first time they had ever had a portrait done in their lives, um, sit down, spend some time with the artist, and then our community organizing team was able to build a relationship and again engage with people in really creative and interesting ways to ensure that the voices of their community and their dreams and their aspirations of what community space can be uh, were, were captured. So we spent, we had about 150 people um, who participated in that. High level statistics, we actually had over 200, uh, 2,500 uh, conversations with the local neighborhood. We spoke with over 1,800 people. Again, and it was centrally important to us that we really made sure that we spoke to as many people as possible. Um, I won't go through all these statistical slides. Um, just to highlight what we heard, and I think many people have talked about this before. Again, in this particular neighborhood, community safety is the number one priority. It didn't matter if you were a person who lived in that neighborhood in a residential dwelling and you were concerned about the impact of substance use in your neighborhood, or you were a racialized community member who was targeted regularly by the police in relation to that, the, the, their experiences. So safety was a broad um, concern. People were obviously worried about if we were to look at this redevelopment, uh, that in fact there would be a service uh, interruptions, and that we really needed to think about how we created multiply accessible, flexible spaces that really allowed uh, for as many people and as many types of uses as possible, because communities transition. Um, we also heard that it was important to open up the park. Right now, again, there's a huge ball diamond there. The lights shine in the middle of the night. Um, and there was a lot of opportunity when people were wanting to think about it. How do we create spaces where people can come into the park? So that was incredibly important. We had lots of really good conversations about structured use versus unstructured use. Uh, and again, we needed to ensure that we had meaningful indigenous presence in the process. So quickly, high level, we actually, in our site design work, have moved the facility from the east side of the property to the west side of the property. That's allowed us to open up the park on all three sides of the park and into the, into the community center. It allows us to continue to run the existing community center while we're doing construction. Um, and it really, again, improves the sight lines. 
Uh, lots of the design work, and I should mention, we're working with MJMA Architect and West State Landscape to do this sort of schematic and site design work for us. Lots of new expanded sports center spaces, community kitchens, making sure that food security, which is so centrally important, I got one minute, all right, um, and this just gives you a quick view of the schematic design. Again, what we've tried to integrate is a lot of the park into the building, into the facility, um, but also making sure that it is seamless into the community space, into the community center, and that the park can be animated. Um, enhanced green space, um, high level again, just gives you a kind of bird's eye view. We're looking at increasing 250 new trees into this space. Uh, and again, making sure that the park fully blends into the community center is centrally important because it creates seamless access into the community center. Our next step, so we have to complete the feasibility study. We're right in the middle of doing all the financial analysis. I gotta tell you, it's at least $100 million that we're thinking about. Um, we're, uh, we're reporting back to council at the end, uh, probably within the next two or three months on the results of the feasibility study. We're continuing to do community organizing in the neighborhood. It's an incredible opportunity for us uh, to be as part of that community. And we're super excited actually to be working with Ryan potentially uh, on with the indigenous Indigenous Placemaking Council on ensuring that we have um, really uh, creative and interesting ways to ensure that Indigenous presence is included in this. I will share very highly my top three insights. I think I was asked to do that. Everyone has a role to play in development, and I think uh, Adrian spoke about it this morning as well. Social justice and the concepts of equity and the concepts of inclusion have to include the most marginalized people. And we know that especially in dense urban neighborhoods, it's centrally important that those people are engaged. Uh, involved and part of not only shaping the dream, but being part of, of included in, in the operationalization and the realization of that dream. And then, of course, long-term programming uh, is going to be centrally key to the success of this project. So I would just, um, I will draw your attention, more Moss Park project. If you're interested to learn about our community consultation process, we've got a little report. It's online at our more Moss Park website. So thank you very much. All right, I think I'm ready here. I'm gonna hit the start, start button on this timer. I used it uh, to try and practice this, so. Bujo, Brian Gori, Indigenous Kaas, and Nimiki Wikwe Dong and Donji, Bingui Neashe, and Nishnabeg and Donji, and Danoki Winnipeg. So I'm, my name's Ryan Gori, I'm originally from Thunder Bay. Um, I'm a member of Bingui Neashe and Nishnabeg in, uh, on Lake Nipigon, and I work out of Winnipeg. Um, for Brooke McElroy Inc. and as well as the Indigenous Placemaking Council. What I want to talk to you today is uh, about is the Spirit Garden, which is uh, my first architectural project uh, just before I graduated from school. Um, it was uh, uh, part of a larger development and, uh, of the waterfront and is really a creation story on, on multiple levels. So this is the peninsula which the Spirit Garden inhabits. Uh, there's the uh, at the center is the celebration circle. Here, sometimes called the gathering circle. This is the honoring circle at the waterfront, which uh, uh, faces the sleeping giant, if some of you are familiar with. And there's indigenous gardens on this side. And what we've done is we've also um, renaturalized the uh, peninsula to bring back some of the in, uh, natural vegetation. Um, so this is really a, a transformation of the waterfront from what I knew as a child. Uh, growing up there, um, and uh, let's see. So that the celebration circle itself is a bentwood structure, black spruce, cedar clad. Uh, we requested that the materials be traditionally harvested in the sense that something is offered um, before the trees were taken. So an offering of tobacco. Um, we wanted the uh, the four directions to be honored. That came out of community consultation, as well as uh, the eastern and western door were very important to uh, ceremonial uh, connections. The, the form is, is ambiguous purposefully um, so that people can dream into it, so that they can see themselves in it. And that, uh, you know, some people have told me it's a turtle, or it's floral, or it's an eagle lying down, or it's a braid of sweet grass. Um, it's up to them, and it's really nice to hear their own uh, dreams and visions about what it is. 
Uh, this is the honoring circle. Um, has a fireplace that people can gather in more intimate gatherings. Um, the sleeping giant, which I mentioned, is a cultural figure in Anishinaabe culture. Nana Buju is referred to, it, and he's actually credited with bringing fire to the people. So this is sort of a, a way of honoring that. Um, the red stone that's around the fireplace is actually reflective of the red stone that's on the peninsula, which is across the way on the sleeping giant. So it's an opportunity to engage um, indigenous professionals, indigenous crafters uh, in all aspects. It's a picture of me during construction um, as, a, um, as a student. Um, on the right is, uh, is it the right? Yeah, on the right is George Price, who is the, uh, a carver from BC who is related to a, a lady from uh, Fort William. And he was the one who actually built the trusses and harvested the trusses. And Randy Thomas, who's an artist, uh, son of famous artist uh, Roy Thomas, who did some work that uh, skirts the bottom of the celebration circle. So in this um, process in, in engaging the indigenous community, uh, I was involved in um, some of the workshops and you know, hearing, um, um, hearing all the, uh, you hear grievances from other projects, from other things that were unresolved. Um, you know, there's, there's a lack of acknowledgement of history and past. Um, so those things inevitably will come up in every project. Um, so it's important that people are engaged in the right time, in the right way, and you make space for that. Um, so we, we engage with the Robinson Superior Treaty First Nations as well as the local Métis community. Um, some of the really interesting things that uh, came out of it are the are the uses. I'm, um, so here, there's several depictions of what people are using it for. The pride dem, uh, pride uh, gathering at the waterfront. Um, there's a performance by a local theater company here, and at the height of its uh, uh, at the height of its time, Idle No More held their protests there. Um, I went to one, and um, my aunt took me there. It was really cold, and there was probably about eight people there, and so we're walking away and. Uh, trying to be anonymous. And my aunt's like, hey, Ryan, Ryan's here. Ryan's the guy who designed this. So it was kind of a, hey, I just wanted to be here to see what you guys are doing. But um, it's really nice to see the multiple uses, the intention that we put out there, and uh, you know, seeing it being realized. Other uses, like graduation ceremony for First Nations, uh, uh, First Nations school. Uh, I've had people send me wedding photos from here. Um, and the Lakehead teachers, uh, I think it's the association, they, they actually teach their teachers here as part of their orientation. So um, it's a really, uh, really engaging to, to hear about those multiple uses, people owning the space and, and taking it on. Um, well, I'm like a whole minute faster. What I want to do is, um, like I said, this is a creation story, uh, multiple levels for me personally, but for the city, but also for um, our, or, our new organization, the nonprofit, the Indigenous Placemaking Council. And uh, so this is really the impetus of that work. And we've, uh, and Brooke McElroy has done a few projects that have leaned towards what we're trying to achieve uh, with the council. So I'll uh, play a, a short video and uh, Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time afterwards.
what does belonging look like if nothing of your culture, history, language, or art is visible in the streets, parks, buildings where you live, how can you ever feel welcome there? The Indigenous Placemaking Council seeks to restore Indigenous presence to Canadian cities, towns, and communities. Yeah, we'll stop there. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much. Um, what a wonderful spectrum of perspectives and understandings of needs and desires of different people working in different communities. Um, our, our places are um, the people that live in them. And I think that reflected in all of your work is that common thread. Um, we're going to do a Q and A. Um, I'll start with a couple questions. Well, I, we have two mic runners uh, that are moving around the room, and we have, uh, and we're on a bit of a timeline, as you saw with our presenters moving through the, the material. Um, but I, I'm going to start with an opening question, and then, uh, and then we'll pass it off to the audience. So, um, so just think if you have uh, something that you'd like to address, and try and keep the questions quite concise, because we'd like to move through as many as we can. Um, I, I wanted to start with Ryan because we, uh, we just saw your video. Um, in thinking about uh, indigenous ways of knowing and ways of seeing the land, and also um, time scales, structures of thought, what are the ways that we, um, as placemakers and as park makers, can start to translate between uh, Western tool sets in park building and, um, and indigenous ways of knowing? Yeah, well, I think that it's. Uh it's important to acknowledge the different time scales. And I touched on in my presentation about making space and making time for engagement and uh, you know, looking, at, looking, at our, uh, looking to our, our indigenous leaders to help facilitate that. Mm. Um, I'm in a unique opportunity as I have, a unique position as I have you know, some, uh, obviously some cultural background. And so you know, being able to connect with people on a on a little more than ground zero basis, uh, I think is really important for mm. people to see themselves reflected in the process. Mm. So. And I think I, I I'm glad that you're characterizing it as a as a kind of sense of belonging or a a, a, a sense of like beyond engagement. It is um, it is feeling like you see yourself in the process. And I felt that a lot with Mara. What you were talking about um, specifically when uh, when engaging um, sex workers, the underhoused, people experiencing homelessness um, in Moss Park. Of course, those issues are more acute. Um, but you guys have developed a um, a really unique again a tool set um, to kind of bring. Um, those populations, uh, vulnerable populations, into the community um, planning process. And so, what you know, what are some ways that we can now share those resources with other parks and um, and help uh, all of our placemaking activities learn from that really important work that you guys are doing at the forefront of this conversation with vulnerable communities? Well, I mean, you can certainly invite us out. We're happy to come and present. All, invite all of the community out. organizers are around. <laughs> um, I, I think. That I don't know that the community engagement or community organizing is that different in relation to many other uh, places that folks are using. I think this is a particularly unique neighborhood. And for us, it was about ensuring that, uh, that those, those voices were included in, in both the design and the long-going programming. I, our sense in terms of the people, like there was an overwhelming support and interest from, from those communities to be in community, to be in parks, to be accessible, to be visible, and actually to be engaged in community in a different way, mm -hmm. and not just be viewed as a sex worker, not just be viewed as a homeless person, but understanding people at a holistic level. Um, and I think that, that um, you know, our sense is that we've established long-term relationships now with many of the people in that neighborhood. And it's really, some really cool things have come out of it. I talked about a community organizing 2.0, but one of the one thing, we, we are working now with a bunch of um, homeless men who are living in, in Seton House as well as um, uh, uh, Maxwell Meehan, and they're now coming to the 519 to um, and be part of a community course that's teaching them the life skills around cooking. So I think there's incredibly opportunities that continue to expand and to continue to evolve um, as long as you're open to those uh, and you're really listening to the community in terms of their their needs and their and their hopes. And so those kinds of creative community-generated ideas are really what makes this project exciting. Mm. 
Mm, a running theme, community-generated ideas and a highly participatory pro process. Um, Sabina, your work uh, is, uh, is coming from the grassroots uh, perspective. And so you and, uh, and the women on your committee are then dealing with funders and civic partners. On your last slide, you had so many of them. How are you um, dovetailing with those um, partners that are more re bigger and more well-resourced than you are? Um, and in what ways do we need to, uh, to help grassroots organizations interface with big uh, funders, city partners? Um, and make those partnerships as healthy and strong as they can be? Um, starting with, uh, I would like to mention City of Toronto first because we had been involved uh, uh, in animating the park, bringing the infrastructure. I think we had a long-standing relationship with the city now and we have developed uh, uh, the relationship of trust. And uh, I remember when we started our market in 2010, that was like the first formal market with the permits and all. And being a newcomer myself, it was very challenging to go through um, the city permits, the language especially that uh, um, they use. And, uh, but we had very good players, a very good staff at the city level, like Michael Ellison, Costins, uh, Roger McElean. I don't want to miss anybody. In the <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jim Mackay now, and uh, Janie, and a lot of other people who had been really very supportive. And uh, initially, it was challenging and back and forth. And we really had, I really wanted to understand what the city needs. and. F Ha wanted to follow all the guidelines mm. to participate in because it was not for me I was not looking at a one term one season programming or you know just coming in one time doing in the park but I was looking at the long term goal that we have to con keep con doing this continue doing this how do we sustain this kind of programming and the other partners definitely like uh, park people Toronto Food Strategy um, sea loss, uh, not to forget Dufferin Grove, uh, like Center for Local Research on Public Spaces, they provided initially the advocacy for us and um, Evergreen Brickworks. Mm. Um, now we have uh, Black Farmers and Growers Collective. We also have expanded our partnerships with the grassroots elders, with the schools, working with the mm. schools. So I think these, these are the key um, to the success of what we are dealing today. And uh, I think uh, with this working with the city, 2015 was the year when the city came to us telling, we want to partner with you for the Pan Am and Para Pan Am Spectator Jam events yeah. to have it in the park. I think that was amazing moment. And from that year, it has been really a smooth process. And I think we have created, as a grassroots, a pathway for the other grassroots organizations mm -hmm. who wanted to do the same kind of stuff uh, in their local communities, in their parks. And uh, with the other local services agencies or the social services agency, we had dealt with a little bit of uh, power dynamics. Mm -hmm. And we are trying to understand, because we want to work with uh, people uh, and bigger organizations too, and have wanted to understand the, what kind of partnerships that we work with, mm -hmm. the collaboration. Um, Let's keep yeah. talking about that, that question in particular, I think, in the um, other sessions and in the breaks, because it's a big one, um, that, um, that sense that grassroots groups are supported. Yeah. Um, I want to move to Jake. Uh, you're, in your report, you talk about how uh, uh, important it is uh, for people to get involved uh, in some small way first, because then it opens up the opportunity for bigger kinds of civic engagement. So, so what is that like to be bitten by the bug? How do we get more, how do we get more of that, um, and, and what is the... The, what's the appetite for action that is sort of seeded by, um, by things like joining a Friends of Parks group? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really around uh, bringing people together around um, shared interests, so people finding each other. Um, and one of the um, uh, really lovely stories that I heard when we were researching the report was of a community organizer who was working in a park in um, uh, Nielsen Park, I think, in Toronto. And there he was working with um, youth um, consulting around uh, who wanted a skateboard um, uh, park. Uh, there was a skateboard facility in that park. So the youth sort of came together and created um, walks um, that they led sort of their neighbors on to talk about uh, what they wanted to see in that park around, the, around skateboard facilities. And it was interesting, so they, they created this sort of network amongst you know, skateboarders and youth in that neighborhood in that, uh, sort of a local network. Um, and then that uh, allowed them to connect out with 
Um, other skateboarders around the city, and there's a, a the Toronto Skateboard Committee uh, mm -hmm. works sort of on a citywide scale, mm -hmm. um, thinking about skateboarding facilities. So it was interesting to see or, and, and hear this guy talk about how um, the creation of this sort of local network allowed people to come together um, that then allowed them to find other people mm -hmm. um, in other parts of the city that were doing this or thinking about this sort of you know, outside of the neighborhood scale, but on the citywide scale. Something in there about being known for it, just like Sabina is known now and people come to you.